Imagine yourself to be a Chinese peasant who can barely feed his family. Just as the season ends, Manchu officials come and take three out of five cows you had, leaving you with little to nothing. You think for a moment about how everyone in the streets is addicted to seeds because of Europeans. Pesky Brits ruined the people, and the nomads took your cows, and your family is starving. What would you do? Well, let me say it. You would rebel, and all people did, several times. In fact, weakened by the treaties already, civil wars turned the already worsening king into a full-blown battleground among who could rip the biggest piece off of this carcass. During this crisis, four prominent revolutionaries wanted to change this country and bring the golden age it deserved once again. In this video, we will discuss who they are and what were their methods to achieve the utopia they envisioned. While there might be stark differences between them, they had one thing in mind, build a perfect world from the ashes of the old one. Let's first learn what utopia is before diving too deep into this rabbit hole. Utopia might seem like a fairly western concept. The word is of Greek origin and it was first used in Sir Thomas More's novel. It was supposed to be a satirical book as there will never be a place like Utopia, but some took it more seriously than others. This case is a little different when you go to the far east of the world, however. An idea of a perfect, harmonious society is deeply rooted in Chinese culture. This idea is perfectly summarized in the title of Mandate of Heaven Granted to the Rulers of China. The ruler of China is given the right to rule by heaven. If you couldn't rule the country well, you will be overthrown and possibly have an agonizing death at the hands of rebels. Confucius could be considered China's Plato. While Plato was busy writing the Republic, he wrote the Book of Rights centuries ago already. In one of the chapters, he mentioned something akin to a utopia called Datong, or Great Unity, in English if you want to be lame about it. He envisioned a world order where everyone is in peace and loving each other. I would like to read a paragraph from the Book of Rights, which will help you explain it easier than I can. They showed kindness and compassion to widows, orphans, childless men, and those who were disabled by disease so that they were all sufficiently maintained. Males had their proper work, and females had their homes. They accumulated articles of value out of dislike that they should be wasted, but without any desire to keep them for their gratification. This was what we call the Grand Union. Now, let me say this. This translation belongs to James Leck, a prominent translator of all Chinese classics, and other translators used future tenses in this section of this book. You may ask, what does this mean? It means that Confucius either talked about a time that is long gone now, which could damage the idea of eternal peace, or envision the future where this utopia will be established by the people. Translation of this passage tends to differ from historian to historian, so political figures could have used whatever fits their ideology the best. However, this is another topic in this video. Going back to the topic, Confucius would provide more context in another book, Spring and Autumn. He would call the final state of a society Taiping, i.e. the state of eternal peace. These texts are more or less the origin of Chinese utopianism, and the people that we'll discuss in this video took massive inspiration from Confucius himself. The first one is Hong Shishuan. He was born to a poor peasant family in southern China. While he was growing up, his family noticed his skills and took great amounts of financial debt for their son to take the infamous civil exam. Hong decides to YOLO the exam. He fails the first time, no problem. He can take it again after all. 
He fails it again. Now it is getting on his nerves. He fails for the final time. He goes nuts and declares himself to be the son of God and the brother of Christ. He goes further and creates a rebellion that will devastate China for years to come. Now that he established his heavenly kingdom, he is going to implement some vast reforms that not everyone will like in China. Banning Opium Use Opium has been the worst enemy of Chinese since the first Opium War and Hong decided that it was enough. No more the Westerners will drug Chinese people and his heavenly kingdom. He made the Christianity official religion in Taiping and used the Chinese translated version of the Bible. Instead of seeing women as the servants of their husbands, Hong sought to create an egalitarian society. In this utopia, everyone was equal. No one was better than the other. Male and female quarters were created and no mixing with each other was allowed. Foot binding, polygamy, adultery and prostitution were banned in Taiping. This rigid religious structure brought Taiping closer to the Christian fundamentalist countries in the West. All of the country will be divided into many military districts. Each district will choose one among them to be a group officer. There will be a state treasury and church for each district as well. Hong decided to take everyone as equal to a further step and abolish the concept of private property in its entirety. After all, everything belongs to God and his kingdom on earth. All of the confiscated lands will be equally distributed among the people for equal use. All of the social wealth will be distributed to people as well. All harvests and products will be given to the state after family took care of their own needs. This way, no one will be better or worse in God's kingdom. To the dismay of Jesus' brother, most of these plans were never implemented, or only limited to Nanjing, the capital of the Taiping. He died from food poisoning during the siege of Nanjing, and Taiping did not last long after that. An important difference between Hong Shishuan and the other political figures of China is that he sought to bring traditional changes that belonged to the weird type of Christianity he created. There were Confucian or Buddhist reactionaries in China. However, Hong was the first person who used Christianity. His revolution was based on the reactionary beliefs of all times. A bit of an oxymoron, I know, but hang on. He was a revolutionary in the sense that he wanted to bring radical changes to society and change the political order of China. A theocratic monarchy might not be the best option, but his ideas are worthy of discussion. The Qing Empire was defeated once again. This time, it was by the neighbors they ignored for hundreds of years, and they have come back for revenge like an attention-seeking child. They lost these lands along with concessions to the Empire of Japan. A high-ranking government official was not happy with this development and knew something had to change. Who was this man? And did he fail the civil exam like our boy Hong did? Well, let's go back in time to understand this figure a lot better. He was born in 1858 and he had a fairly decent life. He was a gifted child and unlike the previous individual we discussed, he passed the grueling civil exam and rose in the government ranks. After traveling to Hong Kong and seeing how rich the people were, he was not amused and decided to study and see what these foreigners knew that they didn't. After rigorous studying, he was getting more and more convinced that the country needed reform and a radical one at that. After some time, he managed to rally some students and petitioned the Guangzhou Emperor for swift reforms. The empire suffered a great loss after the war with Japan and needed massive changes. This movement is called the Hundred Days Reform as it did not last long. These visions of Kang would not be realized as the adopted mother of the emperor who exercised real power staged a coup and put the emperor under house arrest. 
Hung had to run away as he would be killed otherwise. While in exile, he wrote a book called Datong Shu about the reforms that would be conducted and it was such a wild book that it was not published years after his death. Kang came back to China after the republic was installed and continued to advocate for a constitutional monarchy, just like Japan. He also joined to a coup attempt to restore the emperor, but it failed as no one in China wanted to do anything with the monarch. Now that we are familiar with his life somewhat, let's see what he did right that garnered a lot of attention. To Kang, history was moving in the direction of less democracy to more democratic regimes. And in the end, one world government was not a dream, but the course of history. In his eyes, the world would be united by a single public government and free of boundaries such as borders and nation states. The world would be split into rectangular shaped local communities where direct democracy would be in effect. While they were tied to a loose public central government, everyone would be granted as much freedom as they want. There is no place for private property in this anarchist world order. There are public quarters and dining halls. Men and women are equal. In his words, women and men are not even distinguished by the clothes they wear. He opposed the idea of families, attacking the strongest unit of the traditional society in China. He considered the family to be one of the main sources of pain and misery. Also, women being tied to their husbands was nothing short of oppressing women, and women should be able to do what males can do. The families will be replaced with state-run institutions, such as nurseries and schools. Marriage will be redefined as a one-year contract between the male and female counterparts. The children they will make won't bother them. He agrees with the fact that an orphan's life is going to be miserable, so the solution he offers is for the child to never see or rarely interact with their parents. They will be admitted to a public government institution the moment they are born, and the institution will take care of the child. In his logic, if your parent didn't do anything good or bad for you, you will feel natural distance towards them, thus avoiding the pain an orphan might feel when they are separated from their family. Well, I didn't know where to put this, so here we go. Abolishing racial boundaries will be the most difficult one, so he suggests the amalgamation of other races. Maybe you might call it a semi sinicization I will not go further on this topic because I don't want to be yeeted off the platform. Off topic, but he says that eating meat is no longer considered a humane practice in his utopia. So if you want to hate him, it is a justified reason to me. Not even a perfect world can stop me from eating my chicken. He used Buddhism and socialism to create an idea of a utopia, a world where everyone would be equal and content with each other. While his ideas could be precedent to communism, that is weak and open to discussion. What isn't is that he wanted to change China for the greater good he wanted. From there, establish an anarchist world order where democratic institutions will protect the people. You couldn't avoid suffering, and the solution to Kang was not to abandon this world to achieve nirvana. To him, perfection was achievable in this world, and humanity should work towards a utopia. All peoples will be truly equal because there will be no class differences, no rich and poor, and no slaves. Unlike the Ogot figures, Kang did not hold a significant power enough to become a revolutionary. He stayed as a radical dreamer. When Kang escaped to Japan, another prominent revolutionary was already there. This was Sun Yat-sen. He wanted to join his forces with Kang and make moves against Qing, but Kang refused. They both had very different ideas of the future of China. Before that, let's peek at his life a bit before toppling the Qing Empire. He was born to a poor family, and I'm seeing a pattern here in Guangdong. He was at least lucky that his brother went to Hawaii a while ago and brought him there. He studied at British and American missionary schools and was keenly interested in Christianity. Not amused by this, 
His brother sent him back to China. This obviously wouldn't stop anyone, and it certainly didn't stop Sun. He went to Hong Kong shortly later, and he was baptized by an American missionary. He would choose a career in medicine and finish it in Hong Kong. After seeing his country being exploited internally and externally, he stopped practicing medicine and went to be a revolutionary. Sun Yat-sen was a man who never gave up on his dreams of a democratic China. He attempted several times for a revolution and each time they failed. Until it didn't in 1911 Xinghai Revolution. He is arguably the greatest figure of the modern China. He is revered both by the CCP and the Taiwanese government, which is a rare moment in Chinese history and undeniable proof of his influence. It shows that he played a significant role in toppling Qing dynasty and bringing a new age to China. Alongside having the title Father of the Nation, he is also known for the three principles of the people. He states, three principles of the peoples simply means ownership by the people, government by the people, and sharing of social wealth by the people. It also means that great commonwealth that Confucius had hoped for. The third principle here is a mix of socialism and communism. His first goal was to establish a liberal democracy in China, which he succeeded. But this was not the end. To him, the ultimate goal was to unify the world under the leadership of China, he built the Tong world he envisioned. However, he saw this utopia as a grand commonwealth rather than Kang's vision of one world. He said, if you want China to rise to power, we must not only restore our national standing, but we must also assume a great responsibility towards the world. We must aid weaker and smaller peoples and oppose the great powers of the world. To him, it was China's responsibility to bring a new age where everyone will be equal and in peace. In this new world, there will be a universal government based on democracy and popular sovereignty. There will be no distinction between classes, genders, jobs, and beliefs. Women and men will be equal in this society. Everyone will get the jobs and work they want and are capable of. The economy he planned seemed to be a mixture of capitalism and socialism, as he believed that both systems could be used and would complement each other in various ways. This revolutionary man believed in a utopian world and devoted himself to it, but his ideas remained to be a distant dream as warlords crippled China for years to come. Here we are, at the last chapter of our video. The final revolutionary figure of this video, Mao Zedong. His visions of a communist utopia were realized in exchange of tens of millions of people. Like others, he fanatically worked for his ideal utopia. However, he had power and the resources available to whatever he must. Unlike Hong, he did not fall out of power after a few years and died from eating grass. Compared to others, his father was decently wealthy in his area. While working on his father's farm, he read western novels and classics, and was impressed by them. In time, he got more and more convinced by the communist and socialist ideas. When the Chinese Communist Party was founded, he also participated in it, becoming one of the first people who joined to it. But. As Sun Yat-sen died, after a few years, Kuomintang became hostile to them. He would later do the famous The Long March, which cemented him as the leader of the Communist Party. But it took a couple of years to officially become the chairman. After Second World War was over, CCP continued their war against nationalists, and in the end, won. Mao was the chairman. He had all the power he wanted and would move to enact some radical changes to this new China. While some of his ideas failed in the long run, some had limited success. People's communes were established. Each commune housed around 2,000 people. In these rural communes, all of the labor, cooking, education, 
babysitting, etc., were done together. All of the farmers, males and females, worked together in the farms and ate together in the public dining halls. These agrarian communes would become self-sufficient in the long term, achieving the communist society. While Mao aimed at initiating urban communes as well as creating a federation of communes, his ideas were often halted by CCP Central Committee. While Mao imagined this would be a great idea, the reality was much, much different. Most of the communes did not meet their goals due to not having a detailed blueprint of the great leap forward. Famines were commonplace during these years, and to avoid being purged, officials would often resort to lying, which did not help at all. As a result, this policy was declared to be a failure, much to Mao's dismay. At least the rapid industrialization proved to have limited success. Seeing most of the party turning against him, he pulled his trump card for the ultimate showdown. To preserve his utopia, he had to build a youth that would defend the Maoist values and carry them to the future. He also feared that the intelligentsia was becoming less radical and more bourgeoisie, which would drastically decrease the chances of his utopia being realized. Mao declared the continuous revolution and urged the young people to take up arms against the capitalists and remove traditional elements from society once and for all. Paramilitary student groups called Red Guards were formed, and for 10 years, these groups pillaged the countryside, destroyed historical artifacts and places. They even killed each other for not being true revolutionaries, to the point sometimes army had to be involved. Hundreds of thousands of people died for no reason. Even after Mao's death, his wife and a couple of loyal Maoists tried to continue this movement but they were subsequently arrested, ending this period once and for all. We will never know if Mao was desperate and didn't want to be assassinated by his colleagues, or if he genuinely thought his utopian ideas would never be realized. However, I would like to show you a quote from a CCP member to make my point clear. Had Mao died in 1956, his achievements would have been immortal. Had he died in 1966, he would have still been a great man, but flawed. But he died in 1976. Alas, what can one say? <sighs> well, I'm sorry if the video isn't ending in a somber tone. I thought it would be a fun idea to compare these figures with each other, and to an extent, it was. But sometimes, you will be overcome with grief and wonder what is wrong with humanity. It is in these times that you shouldn't forget the fact that good things also happen and is not doom and gloom. Most of the people at Mississippi now probably hate mouse guts, and except for some 15 year old tankies and reddit, nobody would defend such human loss to justify a dream that would never come. Well, anyway. The drought through is already getting too long and I will see you later.